All right, so um, we are now at the fourth seal. Um, no, are we at the fourth seal or the, yeah, fourth seal. We, we at the fourth seal, yeah. Uh, we're gonna deal with the pale green horse and then what we're gonna do, uh, I'm gonna do, do it like this. Deal with the fourth seal and then we're gonna go on a little bit of a side journey where I'm gonna talk about what, what will it look like during that period of time. And um, I've, I've developed a scenario quite a few years ago uh, and 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 I'll read it to you when I when we go through it, and you'll see it's pretty it's pretty incredible when you read through it. That th this is the stuff I did. What past Newton around about 2010, I wrote this, and uh, the scenario is very very much like what's happening today, uh, um, except for the violence and the and the wars and stuff. But we're close to that. Uh, as I've done previously, there are a lot of scriptures that I'm going to be going through. So we'll start off with Revelation chapter 6, verse 7 to 8. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale green horse. Its rider had, an, had the name Death and Hades was followed, following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, plague, and the wild beasts of the earth. Right, so what do we get in that verse of scripture? We have a, we have a horse, we have a rider. It's a pale green horse. It's called, the rider is called death. And what follows behind death is Hades. Uh, that's the Greek word, Gehenna, is the Hebrew word for the place of dead souls. I won't go into that, but I do a separate study on the various different other dimensions that there are. But if a person dies that's unsaved, they go to Gehenna, they go to Hades, to await the second resurrection of the dead. One-fourth, 25% of the human race is now going to die I, I believe prior to the arrival of the sixth seal. So within a, within a span of about three to 3.25 years, one in four people are gonna die. So what you need to do is when you walk out in the street, count four people past you or count three people walking past you. Those people are gonna die Every, it's unbelievable when you try and think about that in terms of the number of people that, that is going to die in the first three to three and two years, two, uh, three and two months of the, of, of the tribulation period. They will die by violence, starvation, plague, and wild beasts. And that's why it's interesting to listen to my coronavirus, post-coronavirus series on YouTube because it links up with the plagues here. So what John the Apostle is doing is, what he's doing is he, is, he is writing to a mainly Hebrew audience. And so there are a lot of things that he writes that he takes, uh, he takes the assumption that they will understand. And so John uses Old Testament terminology here when he speaks about these four judgments. So, and, and we're going to go through them. So sword, famine, plague, wild beasts. So Jeremiah 15, so I'll, I'll read to you various passages of scripture in the Old Testament that relates to this. Jeremiah 15, 2 to 3. And if they ask you, where shall we go? Tell them, this is what the Lord says. Those destined for death to death. Those for the sword to sword. Those for starvation to starvation. Those for captivity to captivity. I will send four kinds of destroyers against them, declares the Lord. The sword to kill, the dogs to drag away, the birds and the wild beast to devour and destroy. Jeremiah 24, 10, I will send the sword, famine, plagues against them until they are destroyed from the land I gave them and their ancestors. Jeremiah 29, 17 to 18, yes, this is what the Lord Almighty says, I will send the sword, famine, plague against them, and I will make them like figs that are so bad they cannot be eaten. I will pursue them with the sword, famine, and plague, and will make them abhorrent to all the kingdoms of the earth a curse and an objective of horror, of scorn, reproach, and he'll drive them out. Ezekiel 5, 12. 
A third of your people will die of the plague or perish by famine inside of you. A third will fall by the sword outside your walls. A third I will scatter to the winds and pursue them with drawn sword. Uh, verse 17, I will send famine wild beasts against you and, you will you, uh, and they will leave you childless. Plague and bloodshed will sweep through you. Uh, I'm just going through these verses of scripture very fast. Ezekiel 14, 21. Well, this is what the sovereign Lord says. How much worse will it be when I send against Jerusalem my four dreadful judgments, sword, famine, wild beasts, and plague, to kill its men and their animals? So what you've got to start to understand is God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And just because we're in the age of grace doesn't mean that these judgments are now gone forever. God is going to bring these judgments back on onto the playing field during that seven-year period. So John is writing to a predominantly Hebrew church, and he gives them a picture that they understand, a traditional picture of what is going to happen. And um, basically, John is now calling on their memory of the Old Testament, of their history, to say this is what is going to happen. So they understood, and they saw what was going to happen. No man... No nation is going to escape this. So the sword, the plague, famine, and, and, and wild beasts are destroyers that get sent as a consequence of sin. So God warns Israel that if they don't follow him and his statutes, he's going to send these four things against them. So in Leviticus 26, 21 to 26, if then you act with hostility towards me and are unwilling to obey me, I will increase the plague on you seven times in accordance with your sins. I will let loose the wild beasts of the field among you, which will bereave you and your children and destroy your livestock and make you so few in number that the roads will lie deserted and desolate. Verse 25, I will bring a sword on you. They will execute vengeance for breaking the covenant. And when you gather together in your cities, I will send pestilence, virulent disease, among you. Deuteronomy 32, 20 to 25, uh, verse 24, they will be wasted by hunger, consumed by plague, and a bitter destruction, and I will send the teeth of beasts against them with the venom of crawling things of the dust. Outside the sword will be reaved, and inside the chambers terror for both young men and virgins, for nursing child, and for man of gray hair. Ezekiel 14, 21, for thus says the Lord God, how much more when I send my four severe judgments against Jerusalem, sword, famine, predatory beasts, and virulent diseases, to cut off man and animal. Ezekiel 5, 15 to 17, again throughout the scripture from verse 16. When I send against them the deadly arrows of hunger, which were for the destruction of those whom I will, uh, I will send against you hunger and wild beasts, and they will bereave you of children, virulent diseases, and bloodshed also will pass to you, and I will bring the sword on you. I, the Lord, have spoken. In Ezekiel 33, 27 to 28, same four come up there. Verse 27, predatory animals, the sword, virulent diseases. Verse 28, desolation. And then uh, Jeremiah 15, 2 to 3. Um, and it shall... And it shall be that when you when they say to you, where shall we go? And again, the scripture, death to death, sword to sword, famine to famine, those for captivity to captivity. Um, and then can you put on the slide, uh, the, the, the table, slide 16. <coughs> so in this table that I've given you, and for your notes, if uh, uh, Nick can email you, the um, notes, not that slide, uh, the one with Revelation 6, Ezekiel 5, Ezekiel 14, Ezekiel 33, and Jeremiah 15. Uh, it's, it's on the previous, uh, last week's notes. But if you don't have it, that's fine, because I've sent you two sets of um, slides this week's that we're going to be doing once I get onto this next phase. And then last week's slide was just the balance of this. Yeah. All right, if you give me two minutes, I'll, um, I'll see if I can get them back up. Sure, and I'll just explain while you're getting it back up. It's not a problem if you don't. Um, the, I've got columns there and I've got scriptures and, I've, I, and I'm just showing you in the scriptures the same judgments 
God is consistent with his judgments. So in Revelation, you've got sword, hunger, death, beasts. And then Ezekiel 5, Ezekiel 14, Ezekiel 33, Jeremiah 15. I've just described to you down the column, linking them across. Sword, 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 sword. It's the same. Um, now, in Jeremiah 46, 10 to 13, the Bible talks about the north country. And this is the area north and east of Israel, including Babylon, Medo-Persia. Now, remember, Babylon came in and then Medo-Persia conquered Babylon. And if you go to Daniel, you can see the, uh, the, the statue, Babylon, the gold, silver, and then the, the Romans, which were the iron, and then the feet of clay, which is the last uh, kingdom that's going to be comprised. And there's a lot. I, I talk about that a lot in the uh, other chapters that we'll deal with. So what happens here is it's quite interesting. Jeremiah 46, 10 to 13 says this, For, for that day belongs to the Lord God of hosts. Oh, there's the there's the um, the uh, slide I was talking to you about. Thanks, Nick. And if you can go to Jeremiah 46, then uh, a day of vengeance that he may avenge himself on his adversaries, and the sword will devour, devour and be sated and drink its full of their blood. For the Lord God of hosts has a sacrifice like that of a great sin offering in the north country by the river Euphrates. Go up to Gilead and obtain healing balm, a virgin, a virgin daughter of Egypt. In vain you will use many medicines. For, for you there is no healing or remedy. The nations have heard of your disgrace and shame, and cry of distress has filled the earth. For warrior has stumbled against warrior, and both of them have fallen together. The word of the Lord spoke to Jeremiah the prophet concerning the coming of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to strike the land of Egypt. Now, why am, I, why am I highlighting a lot of all of this prophetic words to um, Israel at this particular time? What you've got to remember is going back to the introductions and some of the foundations that I gave to you and I taught you, history cycles itself. And you can read a lot about events that happened. They're going to repeat themselves, but at a greater intensity. So the kingdoms that Daniel talks about, you can go and study these kingdoms and what happened to the Jews in these kingdoms. This is going to happen at a great, greater intensity when the Antichrist comes. And so the Lord here is talking to the Jews with regards to the coming of Babylon, the coming of Nebuchadnezzar. And he is basically saying, where judgment is coming. I'm sending the judgment to you. The, the Babylonians are coming. And... Um, it's incredible when you begin to look at what happens there, you can basically build yourself a picture of what's going to happen in the seven years. So we go to Jeremiah 58 to 9, wander away from the midst of Babylon and go out of the land of the Chaldeans. Be like male goats who serve as leaders, as the head of the flock. For behold, I will stir up and bring up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country. They will equip themselves and set up the battle lines against her, for there, for there she will be taken captive. The arrows will be like an, an expert warrior who will not return empty-handed. So those are the north countries that are going to be coming down and taking Israel captive. Then we've got the south countries. And you can go and read about this in Daniel. Daniel's interesting because it talks about this conflict between north and south. And I discussed this in the end times, uh, and, and we'll do this later when the Bible college comes. So the south country is effectively Egypt and northeastern, I would say northeastern Africa, because linked with Egypt, uh, you've got Kush and you've got those countries going into Libya as well. So when God announced through his prophets that Babylon is going to conquer Jerusalem, he warned the people to go into exile. And he warned people if they try to flee to Egypt, God is going to send three of the four severe judgments of after them. So reading Jeremiah chapter 42, 13 to 17. And the, why, why I'm showing you this is that no one is going to escape the, the, the judgments of God on planet earth. These, these, these globalists are going to dig themselves in the earth, but you can read in Revelation, the, the, the judgments coming is just going to basically expose them. They're going to be running to the top. Uh, Verse 13, but if you are going to say, we will not stay in this land, 
and in doing so, do not listen to the voice of the Lord your God saying, no, but we will go to the land of Egypt where we shall not see war or hear, or hear the sound of the warrior's trumpet or hunger for bread, and we will stay there. Then in this case, listen to the word of the Lord, O remnant of Judah. Thus says the Lord of God of hosts, the God of Israel. If you are really determined to go to Egypt and to reside there temporarily, then the sword of which you are afraid will overtake you in the land of Egypt. And famine of which you are afraid will follow you closely after you, uh, after you in Egypt, and you will die there. So all the men who set their mind to go to Egypt to reside there temporarily will die by the sword, by famine, and by virulent disease. None, none of them will return or survive the disaster that I'm going to bring on them. And you can read about that in Jeremiah 44, 13 to 14 as well. Now, beasts. There's two interesting thoughts you can, you can have here. But remember, when looking into the future, hold things loosely in your hand and basically prepare for all eventualities. So beasts are not mentioned directly in these passages about Judah fleeing to Egypt. But the following prophecy about the judgment on Judah at the hands of Babylon describes beasts as cleaning up the dead bodies, but not causing the death like the other three judgments. So Jeremiah 34, 17 to 21 says this, Therefore says the Lord, you have not obeyed me. You have not proclaimed liberty to your brother and your countrymen. Behold, listen very carefully. I'm proclaiming liberty to you. Liberty to put, uh, to be put to the sword. Liberty to be ravaged by virulent disease and liberty to be decimated by famine, says the Lord. And I will, I will make you a horror and a warning to all the kingdoms of the earth. The men who have violated my covenant, who have not kept the terms of the solemn pledge which uh, they made before me when they, split, when they split the sacrifice calf in half and then afterwards walked between the separated pieces, sealing their pledge to me by placing a curse on themselves, should they violate the covenant, these men I will make like that calf. The princes of Judea, the princes of Jerusalem, the high officials, the priests, and all the people of the land who pass between the parts of the calf, I will give into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their lives. And I will like the bloody body of the calf, these dead bodies will be food for the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth. Is Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his princes, I will place into the hands of their enemies and into the hands of those who seek their life and into the hands of the army of the king of Babylon, which has withdrawn from you. So these themes, these four judgments, uh, carry the certainty of death. And God clearly warns that anyone who went to Egypt instead of surrendering to Babylon would die of three of the four. And their dead bodies would then be meat for the beasts, uh, which is the fourth of the severe judgments. Now, the pale green horse in Revelation and the dappled horse in Zechariah, the horses, both are involved with the four severe judgments of God. Now, Jeremiah pictures the Gentiles that attack Israel as beasts. So he has two, opportun two, two views that you can hold loosely in your hands as you begin, if we have to go into this period, as you begin to navigate this period of time. So Jeremiah says that the basically intimates that the Gentiles are, behave like beasts, they're wild, and the nations could be considered coming against Israel or coming against the, the remnant at that time, could be considered the fourth of the, of the severe judgments. So Jeremiah 12, 9 to 12 says this, is my inheritance like a speckled bird of prey to me, unlike the others? Are the birds of prey enemies surrounding her on every side? Go gather all the wild beasts of the field. Bring them to devour her. Many shepherds, invaders, have destroyed my vineyard, Judah. They have trampled my fields underfoot. They have made my pleasant field a desolate wilderness. They have made it a wasteland, desolate. It mourns for me. The whole land has been made a waste because no man takes it to heart. Destroyers have come on all the caravan roads in the desert for the, the sword of the Lord Babylon is devouring for one end of the land, even to the other. No one has peace or a way of escape. So that's pretty, I find that pretty interesting. Another thing I want to just bring to your attention in that passage of scripture is in verse 12. It says, for the sword of the Lord is devouring. 
and he's talking about Babylon. So you've got to understand and you've got to have this in mind that no matter what is happening, God is in control. And the enemy is only allowed to do what God permits. And as we go into a deep study of Revelation, you're going to basically start to see that even these horsemen, even though they have worldwide implications and, 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 and create havoc around the world, each horseman can only do what it's allowed to do by God. And so whenever you go and read or you're listening to podcasts or whatever, and I see this quite often, they, they, even from Christians, they, they intimate that um, the enemy is going to be let loose. And yes, he is, but he's going to be let loose within the parameters that God sets for each one of these judgments to come. So just keep that in the back of your mind. And the enemy, and the, and the enemy is used by God to bring judgment. Think about that. Think of where this world has got to. Think of what is happening in this world. And think of the Antichrist now coming, who's going to be used by the devil to try and change times and laws of God. But I think God is going to allow all of this to take place because when he comes, you know, this is part of his judgment. The Antichrist is actually part of the judgment of God upon mankind. This is what you want. Well, here it is. Now experience it. Another aspect, now I'm going to put my little tinfoil hat on and just go down a little, little avenue here and make, a, make a, um, a statement. And remember, hold things loosely in your hand. It's not that I believe any one of these. It's not that I, but I'm, I'm open to, if it comes, besides being shocked, terrified, I'm able to respond because I've already got it in my mind in terms of being able to understand what is going to take place. So if we take it that these beasts are not actually animals, but actually Gentile nations coming against the remnant, the armies of the Antichrist, this, this satanic army, and the way they behave. So you're looking at the way they behave. So you've got various different streams that you're going to be following. The one stream that you can see blatantly right now is the stream of the um, rioters going crazy. They've been in doctrine these, these kids have been raised up without god education uh in their homes in the movies whatever that they, they've they've been raised in a vacuum without god and, and and the vacuum has to get filled and they filled it with evil two timothy three people so you're going to have them being let loose and you look at them that will give you a picture of what's to come what about a hybrid army of chimeras? No, you're just looking at too much science fiction. Well, maybe, maybe. Oh, there's no such thing as chimeras. Well, go and read Genesis chapter 6. Hybrids, angels, humans. Could that be happening again? Um, do you know that every, every antediluvian site that gets dug up and that means pre-flood flood archaeology, two things take place. One, a, an organization comes and takes away everything. And two, the Roman Catholics build a church on top of it. So what did they find? What are they currently doing? Have they found DNA of a giant? Are they splicing it into a human to make a super soldier? What about robots? AI. I read an article or I read a headline today that, that Australia is joining quite a few countries around the world to now begin discussing the development of AI and its impact in uh, policing. So we want to get rid of all the police now. So what are we going to replace it with? Robots? <laughs> I'm, my personal opinion is those AIs are going to be demons. Anyway. Take the tinfoil hat off. Let's go on. Okay, so before I go on, I'm going to give you a couple of questions. If you have any questions, is there anyone that's got a question? Or is there a question in the, um, in the chat?
Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at Revelation chapter 6 and 7. And the title of this section is Living Under the Second Beast. Life Under the Horseman. Now, I developed this scenario quite a few years ago. And I'm going to go through it with you. Um, this is how I see things going as we progress uh, past the major trigger points. So before we do that, uh, Nick, this, the, the, the new set of slides, this is where we're going to be going to. The slides I sent you yesterday or the day before. So if you can get those slides ready. Yeah, they're all ready to go. Awesome. Okay, so can you get me Revelation chapter 13, the first slide, please? Um, again, a lot of scriptures, so we're going to read scriptures all the time. Uh, when we do, when we study the Bible, we study from scripture. We don't study from an event and then go and try and find it in scripture. We go from scripture to the event. Revelation chapter 13, 11 to 18. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even caused fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs, it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast. It deceived the inhabitants of the earth in order it ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to give, uh, to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark which is the name of the beast and the number of its name. This calls for wisdom, that the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. The number is 666. So the four horsemen, let's quickly just review each of these horsemen. So the next slide, please. The first seal is the conqueror. Then I saw the lamb, Christ, broke one of the seven seals of the scroll initiating the judgments. And I heard one of the four living creatures call out as with a loud voice of thunder, come. I looked and behold a white horse of victory whose rider carried a bow and a crown of victory was given to him and he rode forth conquering and to conquer. Verse three, the second seal, war and violence. When he, the lamb broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature call out, come. And another fiery red horse of bloodshed came out and its rider was empowered to take peace from the earth so that men would slaughter one another, and a great sword of war and violent death was given to him. The third seal, famine. When he, the lamb, broke open the third seal, I heard the third living creature call out, Come, I looked, and behold, a black horse of famine. And the rider had its hand, <clears throat> a pair of scales, and a balance. And I heard someone, like a, something like a loud voice in the midst of the four living creatures say, A quart of wheat for a denarius, a day's wages and three quarters of barley for a, for a denarius and do not damage the oil and the wine. And finally, the fourth seal. When the lamb broke open the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature call out, come. So I looked and behold, an ashen, pale, greenish gray horse, like a corpse representing death and pestilence. And its, rider named, na and its rider's name was Death and Hades, the realm of the dead, was falling with him. They were given authority and power over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine and with pest, plague, pestilent disease, and with the wild beasts of the earth. Okay. So, a couple of things you need to understand about when you start studying Revelation. It's going to be the worst time, according to Jesus, that has ever happened in human history and will ever happen in human history. So the world is going to be torn apart. Most of the world is unprepared. Most of the church is unprepared. And you can go and study that by going looking at news clips of people in preparation for the coronavirus, which is a hoax. Go and study that. 
and see what happened with people. Now, people are going to die and there is nothing you can do about it. Now, remember the words that I used in, in well, the, 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 the prophecies of uh, Jeremiah and that kind of stuff when it says that this is the word of the Lord. You're going to surrender to Babylon. Those that are going to die are going to die. Those to the sword, to the sword, etc. And those that are going to run to Egypt, you're going to die too. And this effect is what's going to be happening in this period of time, in this seven years. It's going to be a world without law and order. So the Antichrist is going to come out and say, peace, peace, peace. But it's going to be absolute chaos and violence in a level of, of the, that is unrepeated anywhere in any time. A world under the horseman, a world under the false prophet. Now, this period we are talking about is the rise to power of the Antichrist. He's not taken power yet but he is rising to power and it's a, and it's a world that has been pushed and, manu and, and maneuvered to worship the Antichrist. And by the time the world worships the Antichrist, the Antichrist is going to be inhabited by Satan. So the false prophet basically takes a predominant role in preparing the planet for the worship of the horsemen, getting all people to take the mark of the beast. And once a person takes the mark of the beast, that's it for you. You're going to be in the lake of fire. Now, there's a saying that there are nine, we are nine meals away from anarchy. And you will see true disintegration of society. And it's going to be happening very, very quickly. And people are going to form into gangs. And, and they're going to go after as, much, as many resources as they possibly can. And they're going to be looking for food, water, drugs, and weapons. And there's going to be some A-grade predators out there. Um, and many large centers are going to be uninhabitable, un uninhabitable. Or the only place that is going to be safe are the New World Order zones, the safe zones, the green zones where they're going to be able to lock down the city. But to get into those zones, you're going to have to be marked. So can you put on the next uh, slide, please? Okay, so this is a slide that um, basically gives you a little bit of more of a layout in terms of where we're going. So if you look at the top, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 9, those couple of verses gives you the layout of from the time of Daniel all the way through to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, specifically dealing with the seven years. Now the Gospels are broken up into Antichrist, war, famine, death, martyrdom, earthly heavenly phenomena and then in the middle the abomination of desolation and then the next column is wormwood now as we go further into the study i start filling out the other columns but in essence that is basically the breakup or the or the breakup of the book of revelation with regards to what is going to be happening uh Zechariah, I've put the Zechariah scriptures in for you. And then at the bottom, I've got trumpets and bowls. So the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments. Now you must understand this. This is my belief. I believe this is how it's going to happen. If you have a different belief, that's fine. Good for you. But this is how, I'm, uh, I, this is how I think it's going to happen. This is how I think it's going to play out. So where we are at the moment is we are, I think, just prior to the start of the seven years. The, the, the enemy forces are ready to, to go into this period. All we're waiting for, I think, is Revelation chapter 5 to take place. Now, we are describing the period just prior to the start and going all the way through to basically the abomination of desolation. That's, this, that's what this session is going to be about. And it's my view. It's how I see this period of time is going to be looking like. Now, in the abomination of desolation, that midpoint of the tribulation, 
uh, in the Bible study that we'll do in 2021 with Pastor Newton, I'll go into all of those passages of scripture in depth. And it's incredible to actually see the, um, the amount of stuff that takes place just in that period of time. So whether it's one day or just a couple of days or a week or two, it's an incredible amount of time, an incredible, an incredible amount of things that actually take place during that period of time. So between, now this is my belief, and I got this off a guy that has really clued up in um, the planets and orbits and things like that. So just to briefly put you into a picture of understanding time, between the sixth seal and the trumpets and the first bowl, you're probably looking at five to five and a half months taking place. So between that five and five and a half month period of time, you have the start of the abomination of desolation. So the sixth seal is actually wormwood. So what actually happens, and this is how I understand it. So just imagine that this is planet Earth going, this is the sun, and the planet Earth is going around, and all the planets are going around. So what is happening is this wormwood system is coming from underneath the plane. So you've got this elliptical plane where all the planets are going around. Now this, this wormwood system is coming from underneath, and it gets caught in the sun's pull, swings around and goes out. So you've got two entrances here. So I think what happens is the earth is coming along and we hit the tail end and we go through the tail and the debris of the outgoing system. And that's the sixth seal, trumpets, and, 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 and then as we go around five months later, five and a half months later, we hit the incoming uh, debris field. And that's the bowl judgments and the, 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 the rest of the trumpet judgments. And what happens then is that's, that's the earthly and heavenly phenomenon that's actually going to be basically changing and, 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 and messing up the earth. But I'll go into that in depth with a couple of my thoughts and my ideas with regards to that. So that's that table for you there. It's a good table for you to study. It's a good table for you to print out. And then what you can do is you can go and read about the Antichrist, what, what these guys are saying about the Antichrist. You can go and read about war, famine. And in later studies, I actually fill out a lot more with regards to who the Antichrist is. So we'll break that up because you can read about the Antichrist in Revelation. You can read about Antichrist in Daniel. And I fill out that table with Daniel, with revelations and all that kind of stuff. So um, just enjoy that. Use that as a point of reference for your study when you read through Revelation. Maybe a bit of homework for you to do is to actually go through and read Revelation with that in mind. So you've got it there and you can say, okay, uh, Revelations chapter 5 is all happening prior. Uh, Revelation chapter 6 to whatever the, the sixth seal is, that's the period of time that we're looking at to basically begin to understand and fill it out. Now, no matter how much you prepare, and I'm talking to myself here, when we actually go into this event, it's going to shock the living daylights out of us. We are going, our normalcy bias is going to kick in like never before. It's, 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 it's going to be unbelievable. We are going to be shocked. We are going to be frightened. But what you've got to remember is if you've prepared yourself, your training will kick in. So it's not your first response that's going to count. It's your second response that's going to count. Think about this. In a matter of weeks, millions of people across the world is going to, have, have going to die, are going to die, have died, are going to die. And as you go into this period of time, the death rate is going to be exponential. Nations are going to be left in ruins. So the Middle East, to start off with, now remember, this is my thinking. The Middle East, certain parts of the Middle East, the place uh, the, where, where Elam is, and I think certain parts of Iran, 
um, it's going to be a, a radiated pile of desert glass. The economies of the world during this period of time are in the process and will be in the process of absolute collapse. I mean, there's going to be nothing left except for those zones. The infrastructures of the nations are going to be absolutely destroyed or in the process of being destroyed and coming to a complete and com uh, a halt. Food, water, power, gone. Cities are going to become wastelands and jungles, or concrete jungles of, uh, of, of concrete and glass and battle zones where people, not armies, people are going to be fighting each other, except for those new world order zones. So when law and order and all the systems have broken down, if you try and think of it, it's going to be a nightmare. It's going to be a dystopian nightmare. And what you can imagine, it's going to be far worse because Jesus says, this is the worst of times. So you take what you can think. You can look back at various disasters in history. And think about what Jesus just said there. It's going to be worse. Not many people have the skills today basically to survive such radical changes in the world and such challenges. And at some point in that long-term crisis, their cities they're, they're basically are going to become uninhabitable, except for those zones. Now, remember, I'm keeping on telling you, except for the zones. I've got a reason for saying that. Now, the autonomy of a breakdown, I'm going to go, first of all, I'm going to go through an autonomy of a breakdown. And then I'm going to go through my scenario that I wrote up. So if you go and study disasters in, 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 in the history, recent history, you can basically look at the autonomy of a breakdown and how it breaks down. And, and, and then you can basically begin to understand the progress of the effect of the four horsemen and what they're going to have, the effect that they're going to have on society and how society will break down around you as those horsemen implement their, their um, mission. We don't have to look further in terms of disasters than the Haitian earthquake and hurricane in 2010, uh, the tsunami in Indonesia, the final financial collapse in Argentina, and the current collapse in Venezuela, food crisis that all that take, took place in Venezuela. Go and read what people said about those situations. Now, when the needs of the population cannot be met within a specific time frame, a phenomena occurs and the mindset of people basically begin to shift. And they begin to act without thinking and they begin to start responding to the environmental changes around them. And so what is going to start to take place is it's an emotionally based response and that leads to more chaos, more instability, and it just adds fuel to the fire. So, so just remember this. The Red Horseman rides, and you've got the various vectors that the Red Horseman is probably going to use. Those rioters, those DRD planted people around the world in their hundreds of thousands, satanic guys that have been activated and ready to go in this period of time. Um, probably super soldiers, probably deep state soldiers. All these guys are going to be ready to go. And, and, and as they begin to collapse society with all the other horsemen and their influences, people's, people's thinking is basically going to start to change. And that is why you need, and that, that's why I spend a bit of time on this passage of scripture when we first started. And that's why you'll be able to begin to understand how people are going to respond. Now, if the rapture is not a pre-tribulation rapture, and I pray to God it is, and I'm wrong, these are the people you are going to face. I need to put the slide up of 2 Timothy again, please. Understand this, that in the last days, dangerous times of great stress and trouble will come, difficult days that will be hard to bear. For people will be lovers of self, narcissistic, self-focused. Now, what I want you to start to do is, as I'm reading this, 
I want you to start to imagine how these people are going to respond when all these things that they are worshiping to create narcissistic uh, people, lovers of money, how are they going to respond when the economy collapses? When one minute they were middle class, upper middle class, could drive around, do what they wanted with their money, suddenly there's nothing there. How are they going to respond? How are they going to behave? Boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, profane. And they will be unloving, devoid of natural human affection, callous and inhumane, irreconcilable, irreconcilable malicious gossips, devoid of self-control, intemperate, immoral, brutal, haters of good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of sensual pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of outward godliness religion. Although they have denied its power, for their conduct nullifies the, their claim of faith. Avoid such people and keep far away from them. A brilliant micro microcosm of that passage of scripture is probably in that uh, Chaz safe zone in Seattle in America right now, where they've done away with the police, brought in their socialist utopia, and God helped the innocent people that were caught inside. Similar to what happened to Jerusalem when the Babylonians arrived or when the Romans arrived as well. So this is the anatomy of a breakdown. Now you can go and study this. It's, I've just taken it off a study and this is basically what generally happens. So phase one is the warning period. Now, although the disasters happen quickly, there is a lot of warning that takes place. Okay. And, and there's a lot of, you, you, a lot of preparation that you can do in the warning period. Um, most governments typically provide adequate help um, in time to get to their populations. Uh, local governments even go as far as to err on the side of caution and, 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 and warn citizens to evacuate during these periods of time. Now, just put your mind into thinking about this. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned it here or it's in the uh, COVID pod podcast, but since the beginning of this year, every two days, there's been a six-pointer earthquake. And everyone is talking about prepare, prepare in the earthquake zones. They've been preparing in the earthquake zones in that, that California area. There's another earthquake that's even worse than the San Andreas Fault, I'm told. How many people have actually prepared in those areas? Okay, and so the warnings go out, prepare, prepare, prepare. And this is the warning period. Now, for some reason or other, when the authority comes and says, you must move, you must evacuate, there are always people that are going to say, no, we're going to stay. Now, some of these citizens are prepared and ready for what may come, and they may feel that they need to stay and defend what's rightfully theirs. But the majority of the population will not be ready for what is about to happen, like a hurricane coming. You can prepare for that. Get out. Lock up your homes and get out. Now, those that are in an unprepared majority and choose to ride out the disaster do so because they are unprepared of how to fully prepare for disasters. And they've become compliant or numb to the heeds and warnings that have been given. Normalcy bias kicks in. Well, you have normalcy bias, I have normalcy bias. When I start to talk about something that is outside your frame of reference, a normalcy bias kicks in where you will say, oh, it's not gonna happen. And, and, and when, when we come talking about disasters and impending death and all of this kind of stuff, normalcy bias kicks in. And this is what happens here. So this is the point in the cycle where herds of people now start to rush into the grocery stores and grab supplies. You know, we're going to be locked down. So what I need now is toilet paper. Are well, you going to be starving in three days? So you're going to eat the toilet paper or what? Plant and grow a toilet paper tree? I mean, I don't know. 
So the problem here now is because of point of supply, your grocery store is going to run out of food and essential goods within hours. Okay, they are not going to be able to meet the sudden demand. And a lot of people are going to go home empty handed. And now they're going to brace for the disaster. The prepared will go home, the unprepared will go home, and they hope for the best. Now, what many people do not realize is that the hardest part of the event is now going to come when it hits them suddenly. And that event will overwhelm the government resources to basically meet the needs of the full population. Now, you've got to think about this. No government anywhere is able to meet a disaster on a large scale. They are unprepared. They can only go into small-scale disasters. The rest of the time, you're on your own. So now we're going to phase two, which is day one and day two of the disaster, shock and awe. So after the initial shock wears off, okay, of the disaster, many people will still be able to cope in the first two, three days of the disaster. Um, and this is what also many people refer as normalcy bias. And it's actually, it's, it's, it's a sort of a coping mechanism. Things are not going to get that bad. Uh, we'll, we'll make it. We'll survive. And many cling on to that normalcy or they'll do normal habitual things so that their little, their little bubble is kept because they don't want to accept what's outside here. So what's outside here is a black swan event. They call it the black swan event. So for example, when we talk about end times, we've been talking, I've been preaching and talking about end times in my whole ministry since the 80s. End, the Lord is coming, black swan event. Most people, straight over. You tell them, prepare. These are the ways you need to prepare. They don't. Because their normalcy bias kicks in, it's not going to happen in my lifetime. So at this point, they are starting to try and wrap their heads around this thought of things are not going to be normal. And the severity of the disaster starts to kick into them and, 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 and they begin to start assessing what they have around them and what they have around them is not enough. So the, your local governments are now trying to scramble to get answers, all the while trying to deal with their own normalcy bias. So at this point, the reality of the situation now becomes more bleak when people realize that due to their, uh, due to down power lines, due to debris blocking the road, uh, preventing access points where emergency organizers are not able to get through, emergency response, responders are not able to get through, the distribution trucks are not able to get through, water's in short supply because the power, something's broken, the water main, um, petrol basically is run out. Brisbane's got nine days worth of petrol. And, and um, other, other things in that area that are pertinent to you living in a society, your, your, to keep your society going, everything gets hit instantaneously in one or two days. And the pressure of that on a local city scale and larger overwhelms the government's response to basically come in and help people. And that is when the breakdown starts to take place after day three. So phase three is the breakdown of society. Three to seven days, your society is going to break. Now, have you ever heard of these words? We're three days away from anarchy. We're nine meals away from starvation. Okay, so think about that. I would say many of you, if you had to go and count if, I, if, if the water supply goes, if the food supply goes, if the power supply goes, and if the groceries 
are the, the, the supermarkets are now empty and can't be refilled because there's no petrol for the trucks to get in. They prevented from getting in. How long do you have before you start to starve? Right now, how long? How long do you have before you start to starve? And in essence, most people have no, uh, sort of nine days worth of food in their homes right now. So the breakdown starts to take place from day three when it dawns on them, they're on their own, to day seven, when the disaster really takes effect and all they have is what they have. Five virgins with oil in their lamp. Five virgins with no oil in their lamp. All you have when the disaster hits is what you have currently. All right, and that's when people's minds now start to change, okay? And if they've grown up in a vacuum of no God, been fed from the education system of the world, they are two Timothy three people. So multiple factors that contribute to the breakdown of society. Uh, failure of adequate government response, population density, Citizens taking advantage of the grid being down. Overwhelming of the emergency response team. So for whatever reason, three to five days, three to seven days, following the disaster is the bewitching hour. And during that short period of time, the population slowly becomes a powder keg full of angry and desperate people. Your child is starving and you're a Christian brother. You will find food for your child. Stating fact, yeah. Now, if this scenario isn't bad enough, now I haven't even gone to my scenario yet. I'm just giving you the education with regards to... Um, what happens when from from people that have studied the scenario by the uh, civilizations or cities that have been hit by um, disasters? So if this isn't bad enough, at the end of this time frame, at the end of the seven days, there's going to be an increase in illness due to the cramped living quarters. Uh, emergency shelters are going to be overwhelmed. Sanitation-related diseases and illnesses are going to start because of the compromised water sources and being people being exposed to natural elements. Um, your death rate is now gonna start to climb, especially from people that have pre-morbid conditions, people that need medication, that are on constant medication for their survival, people that are on machines for their survival, the old people, the young people are gonna be susceptible to these kind of diseases. And so your death rate now is gonna start to climb, okay? So in the aftermath of the Haitian earthquake, sanitation-related epidemics became one of the largest concerns um, for the disaster victim uh, survivors. And um, that, that resulted in probably the largest cholera epidemic to date. Okay, so then we go into phase four. Now that's eight to 30 days. And that's when, when survival, people can begin to basically, begin to, the, the, the responses now start to take place. So despite what we want to believe, most recoveries are very, very slow and difficult in progression and require long-term planning. And of on average, it takes a city one to two weeks after an event takes place to basically begin to restore what was broken to get back to that normalcy of civilization that is very, very thin. Now, it wouldn't be so bad if we, we had the uh, knowledge and infrastructure to live the way they did back in the 1800s. But today, that's simply not the case. And um, this is, this in my view, uh, this is, in my view, not based on entering the seven years, okay? This is just 
what I've gathered and what I've learned from people that have studied a breakdown of civilization in an event. So you, you've got between one and 30 days before it gets back to normal. Now, I've now reached one hour, Pastor Newton. So how much more time do I have? Guys, how much time do I have? You can have another 15 minutes if you want. 15. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Now let's go into my scenario. This is what I developed way back, I think around 2010. I wrote out the scenario on how I see things taking place under the horseman and what life looks like under the horseman. So it's a little bit of a fictional story that I've written. So I'm going to read it to you. <coughs> um, I'm, for, for the sake of time, I'm not, I'm not going to read the scriptures. So what I would normally do now is I'd read to you the four scriptures of the four horsemen again. So day one, everything is normal or seemingly so. And the news are reporting an outbreak of yet another avian flu in Asia. <laughs> I wrote this in 2010. Avian flu in Asia coming up here. An alert has been released by the World Health Organization, but there are no new cases in Australia. The government raised its travel warning status to Asia on its website. No one paid attention to this bulletin. Normality bias is at its height. People are in a state of shock as they listen to the news on the latest war in the Middle East. All is quiet in the Middle East, too quiet. It's been about seven months since the war. The ferocity of the war shocked the world. The UN are still in a flap about who started it, while everybody know, everyone on the street knows it was Iran. Iran and its coalition attempted to strike Israel under the cover of the confusion of the Sy Syrian civil war. A simultaneous launch of a few tactical nukes from Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, at the same time as they turned their troops around in Syria and drove them to the Golan Heights. What a mess. It was a hor horrific move on their part as the rocket somehow did not work and exploded on their own troops who had been moved to forward positions on the Israeli border. Hundreds of thousands of troops got caught in the nuclear blast, including many of the armies fighting in Syria. Russia tried to warn Israel not to retaliate, but this seems to, have, uh, but, but this seems to be the whistle for everyone to let loose. The Israeli response was decisive and deadly. As the Arab and Iranian forces together with the Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank went into a frenzied attack on Israel, reminiscent of the Yom Kippur War, the Israeli Defense Force lashed out in simultaneous strikes, both conventional and tactical. The wave of death and destruction that followed were of biblical proportions. The, Iranians, the Iranian ISIS threat has just vanished into a pile of irradiated, decaying corpses. They've just finished burying the bodies in the valley called Hammond Gog. It's taken about seven months for this cleanup to take place. Special burial details were used as most of the millions who died, most of them were due to radiation. Reports are still coming in on strange occurrences that took place in the battlefield. A new sweep of the land is taking place to begin the cleaning cleansing process. The Israelis have taken possession of most of the land and equipment used by the armies and are including it and the resources of the land to fuel their economy, which is reeling from the shock. The world is clamoring for peace. A proposal at the United Nations has emerged and is gaining popularity. And that is to form a global government, economic and religious system in order for this horror not to take place again. The Pope who recently resigned from the papacy is being touted as the man to head up this initiative as he has successfully negotiated the peace treaty between Israel and her Arab neighbors between the UN, the armies of the nations that fought, and Israel. They are heralding it as the peace treaty of all time. All parties recognize Israel's right to exist, and in exchange, Jerusalem and especially the Temple Mount will now fall under the Pope's control with a special dispensation for the Israelis to begin building their temple on Temple Mount. The peace in our time treaty, they are calling it. On the surface, all seems quiet, but to the trained eye, everything is not right. 
cyber wars have been raging in the East and the West. Everyone is blaming what's left of, of the Russians, the Chinese, the North Koreans, and the hackers. On the news, the stock markets, even though they are not indicators of the coming crash, they are not indicators of the coming crash or jittery and recording massive downward movement across the board. The world is in the middle of a global financial crash, but no one seem, sees it because it's all taking place in slow motion. Those who have eyes opened are noticing that slowly there are more and more staple food shortages and the prices of basic food staples are going up. Everyone is going about their daily business as if nothing happened. Hackers would crash the bank system and the government and the banks would re reinflate it. Those that had a little insight and forewarning have pulled out all their savings and investments out of the banks. Not that it did any good to be hoarding paper money. Even to the casual observer, the financial markets were a complete sham. Trading bore no resemblance to reality. Some people began to realize that the derivative were weapons of financial mass disruption. Definition, derivative, noun, something derived. Essentially, they were fi fictional instruments invented by international bankers to create the illusion of, free, of the free market system, a financial system of solvency and solvency. The hackers revealed them to be hollow shells that they were. However, in doing so, they crashed the entire financial system. Everything was linked to the derivative markets. So when it was exposed and blown wide open, so was everything else. The wealth of individuals and nations vanished overnight. Most people didn't care how or why this happened. All they cared about was how they were gonna, it was gonna affect them. The banks shut down all services on the Friday afternoon. ATMs, credit cards, f -pass, online services, etc. No one could access their accounts or financial services or use electronic services for any transactions. Nothing worked. Those who had cash emptied the, emptied the supermarkets and petrol stations within hours. All useful items, food, water, petrol, etc., was gone. The economy had finally collapsed. People who a few months and days ago were living, comfortably, uh, living a comfortable middle-class lifestyle suddenly found themselves destitute. No one expected the sudden complete collapse. Most were caught by surprise. No one ever expected the mighty wealthy West to now be worse than the third world. The mainstream media now started to go after and mount a campaign against those who'd been warning, who had been warning after this for years, asking the questions, how did they know this was going to happen? How come they were prepared? Persecution ramps up. These groups suddenly learned the importance of becoming gray men. They learned to be silent. Most of the population, however, did not know where to turn or to whom. Most did not expect this to last, but things just got worse. The new world elites collapsed the system and began to implement their plan of global governance. The horsemen had begun to ride forth on the earth. Day four to day 16. This was the start of the great death. Millions in this country are starting to starve. This first waves of death and dying are starting. Billions across the earth. With the financial collapse, everything has begun to break down. The government was unable to cope. Everyone was on their own. Society began to unravel fast. The cities and high density areas had become wastelands and danger zones. The nightmare had only begun. Very few people had the skill sets to survive past the first 30 odd days. Realization of what is happening is slowly beginning being realized. There is no help coming. You're on your own. No one, no one will provide you shelter. No one will feed you or your family. No one will provide you with drinking water. No one will protect you. No one will provide you with medical attention. Things quickly get desperate. The average family realizes all too late that they only have a few days worth of food and no means to acquire more. It now becomes apparent that each person is responsible for their own family safety and security. The self-reliant are now drawing unwanted attention on themselves and becoming targets of attack. Violence becomes the new norm. The sudden collapse of this highly complex civiliz civilization system will lead to horrifying con consequences. The collapse of this society will happen fast. This society is but nine meals away from anarchy. The starvation begins. The slow death by hunger and starvation begins. The food trucks have stopped rolling. The food rights are over. The ninth meal has been eaten. Ordinary people now begin to scavenge, hunt for food in concrete jungles of glass, 
and steal. Violence and death increases. Society, society raised on celebrity chefs, cuisine and refined food now, become to hunt, now begin to hunt for, for anything. Soon the stockpiles in areas as well as the game in the immediate vicinity are depleted. Food hunting, hunting needs to foray further. People will begin to try to migrate. The plagues begin. In 2007, for the first time in history, more than half the world's population now live in cities, a rough place for the spread of a deadly virus. Are there test runs, Ebola, Zika, swine flu combined with avian flu, and now Corona? Question, how do you think the people of your neighborhood will react when things go bad? Pandemics come and go over 40 years and scientists can predict the cycle. There hasn't been a major outbreak for the last 100 years. Given the amount of global networking, a disease could be spread around the world in a matter of hours or days. If it gets spread by the, new world or, by, by the new world order, they could do it all over and make it look like a natural release. It will be in the city before you know it. This is important to note. If people had, have been warned a few times before, panic by media with false flag events, they will brush it off. Sensible reaction goes down, so when the real one hits, they will brush off the warning signs, and by the time they realize what is going on, it'll be too late for them and their families. They die. What, what will it take for them to realize that this is the big one? We've been talking about end times for decades, but this might be the big one. Matthew 24, 37 to 39. As in the days of Noah, uh, by the end of the day, news reports of, growing severity, of the growing severity of the situation were increasing. The number of reported cases had grow, grown into hundreds of thousands worldwide. The death rate climbed, the dead lie unburied on the streets. They contribute to the diseases already running through society. Now starts the global effort to produce vaccines. Rumors abound. Now starts the big lie, positioning the population for a savior. Day 17. Initially, many people will leave the city, taking the disease into the countryside. Supplies will be very hard, if not impossible, to get. Store shelves will be wiped clean. Fuel may be unavailable as retailers have drained their tanks and resupply unlikely. There may even be fuel rationing as what, whatever local supplies are ordered, save for official use only. <coughs> Bank branches will likely be closed and ATMs long since emptied of cash. The roads will be packed and tempers will be high. Fear and panic will set aside can't be set, uh, set us, uh, otherwise calm people off at the least provocation. Violence and civil unrest grows, especially if it is preceded that they, uh, if, if it's perceived that there's no official policy to slow and prevent people from leaving, such as the kind of checkpoints and vehicle searches. The masses of evacuees will spread throughout the surrounding countryside and likely overrun smaller surrounding communities, overwhelming their own stocks and retail supplies and services. Temples will be high. Violence will be openly evident. Don't be surprised if small communities even try to block the main road into these areas. The gray man, how invisible can you make yourself? If people see you, you want them to roll their, their, their eyes to roll over you. Roadblocks and authorities, all major routes will be locked. According to agenda, a UN agenda 2030 and 2021. 20, Choke points, guard. Capture points, eyes in the sky, 24-7, watching and recording. Mainstream media is now the voice of the government, as it is now anyway. Lots and lots of sheep will begin to be herded. This is the age of the betrayer. The red list comes out and starts to be implemented. With enough people trying to evacuate, the roads will become so jammed that at some point you'll have to get out and walk. People will even die in their vehicles and those cars will be jammed up on the roads and make it impossible to pass. Gridlock will be a major event. With this, the desperation goes even higher. Some people will, will be massacred as police pretend. Uh, uh, some people will massacred as police pretend to be authority in order to rob, rape, murder those they catch in their roadblocks. It will be difficult to tell who is official and who isn't, who's on their side and who isn't. Remember, at this point, the government of the worlds are being drawn together under the false prophet and the Babylonian government, who will be pointing to the beast. Any assistance from them will cost you your freedom. In the light of you will have to join the beast system to get official health protection, shelter, food, and water. Many people at this point will make mistakes and be deceived. Many Christians like Esau 
will sell their souls, their inheritance for a plate of food and a bottle of water. We will now enter a time of the great falling away. Do you know that there's some preachers now preaching that this falling away apostasy is actually the rapture? Think about all the ways out of the city in light of the population that equals chaos on the highways. Added to this, the authorities will be keeping people in cities to control the populations. The new world order are now emerging to seize control. They begin to set up their survival zones, populating them with those who will bow to their authority and those who will have the skills that they can use in the recreation of their new golden age, the Genesis 6 story. An attempt will be made to keep emergency services functioning. Only a few people will be showing up to work. You will have to, you will have a shortfall. You will have a shortfall when you accurately need an increase. Hospitals will not admit any more people, so you will have people out on the streets and sidewalks sick and dying. There will be shortages, shortages of everything due to the jet logistical system being down. What happens to this city when one third of the population on average begin to die? That should be one fourth. One fourth of the population of the city begin to die. Will healthcare providers abandon their patients? They will try to do the best they can, but they will be overwhelmed. It will reach a point that they will prioritize looking after themselves and their families and they will leave their posts. People will begin to hide their skill sets, not letting people know who or what they are. People will begin to hide their resources, not letting people know what they have. Betrayal will increase. Food shortages will become, will be, food storage will be considered a crime. Hoarders will be accused of crimes against humanity and not working for the common good, the rebuilding of the new world order. Day 19, a state of emergency declared nationwide. An interesting point was that at this time, there will be military exercises going on at this very time. So the troops will have already been deployed so that they can curb the riots and terrorists. Most people will be happy with this. They feel safe seeing them on the streets. An interesting coincidence is that the military deployments were taking place all over the world. The army gets deployed onto the streets, time to implement the changes to the world and to bring it under the new world order, one world government system. Most events that are dangerous indicators to what the new, most events that are dangerous indicators to what the new world orders are doing will go under the radar, as most people are living in the matrix. Think of the scene in the matrix where they are presented with the red pill and the blue pill. The big events happen behind the curtain, a lot of misdirection. So most people will miss what is actually happening. A lot of information is being thrown out in the mainstream media and especially in the alternate media, as this is where it will circulate all sorts of signs. Shelter in place, stay at home. This is something to watch for, especially if you think about Agenda 21 and I think Agenda 30. Now remember, I wrote this in 2010, I've not updated my notes. This means locking down the population and keeping them in place, called shelter in place. The future plan, lockdown of major cities and towns in the US, UK, EU, following a collapse, a major crisis, and probably Australia as well. In the US, such a plan is known as shelter in place. The New World Order propaganda machine, media, Hollywood have started to promote this shelter in place strategy in their movies and TV shows. For example, the TV show, Madam Secretary, they had an episode where a dirty bomb got exploded in Washington and they locked down the population in that episode. Predictive programming, preparing people to these disasters in how they need to respond. This was planned long ago, and there are, many, uh, there are many very good reasons for getting the people to stay put and prevent the uncontrolled migration of people from major population centers. Locking down a city is well within the capabilities of the major Western governments, and the US showed that they could do this with a heavily armed populace, even with a heavily armed populace during the Boston bombing event. Getting people to shelter in place during the crisis is now their plan A. So I want you to note this, the mechanisms for mastering the human domain, that's what they call it, mastering the human domain are now fully in place. And should the governments of the world decide to lock down the populations, they could do so snapping it on very quickly and too quickly for most people to basically respond. Speed and surprise are part of the plan and are required in order to complete such a plan with minimal civil disorder. Travel restrictions, a population will not be allowed to migrate during that time of public crisis. You have seen this being 
implemented. So it was, they did military operations a couple of years back. Specifically in Texas, they did operation and you see their Jade Helm. They've now done it worldwide. They've implemented a plan worldwide to lock down the populations and they locked down the whole world. Think about that. They locked down the whole world just like that. So the, 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 the mechanisms to do this, they've already got it in place. Now, this is important. And I believe we are right now living in the build up to the seven years. It's a slow burn. What do I mean by that? Small, significant things are happening all around you, but most of the population are completely unaware. My personal opinion, we are in the middle of the financial collapse of society right now. But it's a slow burn. Everything is happening in slow motion. I think the economy is in a position where it's unrecoverable. We are headed for a massive correction and nothing can stop that, but it's all happening in slow motion. So people are not seeing it. So you look at the collapse in the USSR or the collapse of apartheid in South Africa. It wasn't one sudden event that took place. It took place gradually, small changes. And then suddenly it was implemented. So we are living through a massive, major geo societal, societal political change that is taking place right now on a daily basis. And if you're not alert to it, you're gonna live, miss it completely, marrying and giving in marriage. That's where most of the people are. Our danger is that we have so much information that lots of people are just, so much information coming in at us that lots of people can't sift it out. And that's why I've got this like, that's why I've got that graph, that table, that I'm able to look at these events and be able to I've trained myself to pick up where they fit in. So for example, in my studies, and I'll be presenting this in the post-coronavirus study, I'm looking at the finances behind. So Bill Gates seems to be involved in the science of, of locking down systems and vaccines and, and marking people. George Soros seems to be in charge of financing all the, uh, the civil unrest institutions. The Rothschild seems to be the ones that are financing Israel and getting all of that stuff sorted out. So I'm busy starting to find out all these lines and traces and, and understand, understand where they come from. So we've got the situation with regards to mastering the human, dom human domain. And now we look at the current coronavirus pandemic. They have successfully run a pale horse test and I think now with the civil unrest that's taking place worldwide, they are testing their systems with regards to the red horse. <coughs> okay, so let's go to day 21. New stations are now emergency broadcasts on behalf of the New World Order. So the new stations right now are basically corporate media. They're controlled by the New World Order. Death tolls continue to rise exponentially into the millions. The New World Order will now clamp down the population and hold them in their homes. Curfew martial law. Martial law, no private property, fulfillment of Agenda 21. The infrastructure outside the New World Order zones will by this time have completely collapsed and people will then begin to realize that they're on their own. Water, electricity, supermarkets, sewage, police, ambulance services, communications, phone networks, internet, never ever gonna be the same again. Things will never ever get back to what it is right now once they get to that day. The new world order will have their communication systems with their green dome communications. So they'll have all their communications going, but the rest of the world will have nothing going on. And I gave you a picture of how the military users um, have, have got the capability of walking into a situation, applying, certain of their um, communication vehicles and actually boosting what has collapsed, the communication system of what has collapsed in, in society right now. Day 22, internet fails. Try and think for a moment how you are gonna survive when the internet fails. How are you gonna connect with your pastor? How are you gonna know what's happening? 
international trade collapses, <laughs> Alistair. <laughs> Not this, this. <laughs> the biggest of all dominoes, no liquid fuel deliveries. That means no deliveries of anything. You're completely on your own. Banks finally collapse, logistics finally collapse. Nothing will ever be delivered. No goods, no services. Any form of production stops. Production means no more jobs, no more paychecks. You cannot earn your living. Safety systems have stopped working. Absolute chaos outside the new world order zones. Your opinions, how you think and view the world, and your theology will now change. And violence is now going to ramp up to levels that are demonically fueled and desperation fueled. In the United States, during Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, it took four days for the city to break down and go into anarchy. How thick do you think the veneer of civilization is in your city? Especially when you deal with 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5 people. Day 24, power stations go offline due to staff shortages and fuel shortages. The power finally goes off, except for the new world zone order for areas. Darkness and silence descends. It's going to be darker and colder and hotter. The lights go out and the industrial society stops working. All communications, resources, services will now be controlled by the new world order. Question, how effective are you able to live without electricity? If you want to put yourself to the test, say to me, if you're living in Brisbane, David, I want to have this electricity test. Uh, I'll sign up for it. And then there'll be one day when I will come to your house and just without warning, switch off all your electricity and you will have to be without electricity for 48 hours. But you're not allowed to leave your home. That's a good test. Anyway, this is going to have a domino effect. No communication, darkness. When the lights go out, we're now stepping to the unknown. It gets darker, it gets colder, it gets hotter, it gets wetter, wetter, it gets dirtier. It will be more work. It's going to be more risk. It's going to leave you hungry. It's going to leave you thirsty. Week 12, death tolls now step into the hundreds of millions. Week 14, sewage is down. How are you going to deal with your sewage if you're sheltering in place? Disease on the rise. Water finally stops running. And if you've got running water near you, it's probably going to be polluted by that time with all the dead and sewage. If you're in the city, it's a massive problem with unburied, dead, garbage, sewage. There'll be more dead than the system can actually cater for. The system is not designed for that level of death. You're now going to be dealing with cholera, dysentery, famine, starvation, and the death toll now starts to climb exponentially. And the world is never going to go back the same way. So that is life in the first half of the tribulation period. 